Right. Good morning, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay? Online? All right. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and uh, we'll get into our session today. Let's pray. Uh, I'd like to invite any one of us to pray. Uh, Chira, would you like to pray? Chira or Rivali, anybody can pray, please. OK, anyone else? Go ahead and pray. Oh. Uh, are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, Nina. Our gracious, loving Father, we thank you for this day and this time that you have given us, Lord, uh, to come to your feet. And to we pray at this time, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive your word. Oh, we thank you for this class, Lord, and all that we need to learn, even as we grow in the grace and knowledge of you, and to know how to be effective no matter where we are, Lord. We commit our time once again into your hands. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nina. All right. So uh, last class, we completed Chapter 3. We talked about right workplace attitudes. And now we'll get into Chapter 4. So this is the next section. Uh, we'll talk about corporate vision, values, sorry, vision, mission, values, and culture. Right now, if you look at an organization, you know, every organization, no matter what uh, organization it is, they would have a vision, they have a mission, uh, they have values, and they have certain cultures. Right now, every organization may have different visions, different missions, meaning how to fulfill that vision. They may have different values and different cultures, right? Uh, uh, and, and so when you and I are working in an organization, right? Now, uh, I always want to say this. Right? Uh, now, don't think, OK, I'm going to be a pastor. How am I going to apply all of this? Or I'm going to be an evangelist. No, look at it as, OK, I'm going to be part of an organization, right? Uh, you're part, even though it's ministry, it's part of an organization. Or you're working in a small scale sector, you're part of it organization right so what is a corporate vision a corporate vision describes what you wish to become as an organization and may include why you wish to become that so a corporate vision is basically uh, uh, an organization where they have a vision and they state it now i'm sure all of us know what's the vision of our organization what's the vision of our organization <laughs> Right? We know it. Right? We know that. And so vision is important. So imagine we are an organization and say, hey, what is the vision that you have? Oh, I'm not sure what is the vision. We just want to do ministry. That's not that's not good enough. Right? Well, a vision is something that is pursued over time. Right? Uh, now picture this, in 2001, saying to be salt and light to the city of Bangalore, voice to the nation and the nations. There were 10 people in church. But a vision is something that is pursued over time, as the organization grew, right? We saw the vision coming into fulfillment, right? So it's not something, a vision is not something that can be accomplished in a couple of years, right? Uh, it's always an ongoing process. Right, and the mission describes how we're going to achieve the vision. Right, if we got a vision, how are we going to achieve that vision? Now, remember, just having the vision is of no use. Right, you have a vision and say, "Hey, I have a vision." Right, it's uh, it's of no use. The vision needs to be backed up with a mission. The mission is how you're going to achieve it. Right, so. I'm going to use this example of APC, right? To be salt and light in the city of Bangalore. So that's the vision. How is the, what's the mission? How are we going to achieve that vision? Okay, we first start with a strong local church, raise up leaders, 
start locations in different parts of the city. Okay, reach out to schools, reach out to colleges. You're penetrating, you're permeating into different spheres of influence. Somewhere we are trying to be a salt and light. Yes, uh, then okay, a voice to the nation. How can we reach the nations? You're just here, city of Bangalore. Okay, now live streaming, right? So people from different places across our nation are watching conferences, our pastors' conferences, Christian leaders' conference. All of this, what is it? Ha what's happening? We're impacting the nation, and now we want to go global, right? So we want to see people from other countries being impacted from what APC is doing. Now all of this took time, but there was a mission. Right? There were certain things that had to be done to fulfill the vision. Okay, Then there are values which describes what the organization stands for and their ethical standards. Right? What, are, what are the values that we, they carry? Right? Uh, every organization should have certain values. If they don't have values, then it's, it's just functioning. Like the wheels are in motion, but they don't know why they are in motion. There should be values, right? <clears throat> Certain ethical standards. Uh, then you have culture. Describes the work environment, right? Now, the culture of a certain organization can vary. Like, like let me give you this example. Now, when I was working uh, in the corporate sector, um, we were asked to wear formals, right? So we, I was more into training, learning, and development. So we had to wear formals and we had to come in and uh, not a tie at all, formal shirt, formal pant, but dress neatly. And you go there, you train the new batches. You... But now things are changed. right? So we may have people from big organizations, maybe Apple and Google, they come with shorts and they sit in the office or they don't, they don't care what kind of hairstyle they have. Nothing matters now. But they're the best organization. That's the work culture. There are some organizations who say, you do what you want. You want to work from India? You want to work from uh, America, from any other country you work? I want the work done. I want to see numbers. Where you sit, you want to sit in an office, you want to sit in uh, your home, you want to sit in another country, that's up to you. I want to see the numbers. Right? And some organizations know you have to come. You have to be there in office. We want to see you. We want to work together. Right? So every organization will have different work cultures. That's a work environment. Right? And the best part about us as people, when we join an organization, we get adapted to the work culture. Right? Nowadays, it's very easy to adapt. Right? You can just change the way you, of course, you're not changing your values and your principles, but the work culture, you adapt to it. Right. So in general, if you see that people are not always looking for a job just to make money. See, money is part of it. Right? Uh, it is important. Right? Uh, nobody wants to work for free. You work. You want to get paid for what you work. But there's also something called as job satisfaction, where you feel, OK, hey, what I'm doing is really I'm really impacting myself. I'm impacting the organization. And I'm able to you know, do something for the organization. This is job satisfaction. So yes, there are people you know, nowadays, if the pay is good, I'll work no matter what it is. Right? Uh, but most likely, uh, people who work in organizations, they like to have this job satisfaction. So let's look at a few points uh, on this corporate vision mission, values, and culture. Again, uh, even as we go through this entire uh, topic, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, let me just present the notes so uh, it's, it's going to be easier for all of us. Oops. Yes, uh... Yeah. So we are in chapter four. Let's look at this. OK, first point, your vision influences your productivity. Let's read Proverbs 29, 18. Go ahead. Anyone can read. Proverbs 29, 18. 
where there is no revelation the people cast off restraint but happy is he who keeps the law mm. the word revelation refers to inspired dream or vision right uh, so when we have a vision when we have a dream or a purpose it, it is also referred to as revelation now where there is no inspiration there is no course of action right we what's it we're going to wander about aimlessly have you seen people on the streets right sometimes they'll be just walking they'll be looking everywhere and walking have you seen people like that right they, they don't know what to do why they're aimless right? they just don't know what to do they're just walking and, and what's the thing there's no productivity there Right, and so, but have you seen people who walk on the street? They know where they're going. Okay, I need to get there. So, hey, I have to get there. There's something that I have to get done. A compelling vision captures the imagination, grips our heart, fires up passion, and inspires action. Right. So when you and I are part of an organization, we need to, you know, like really take that vision and put it into ourselves now it may be you know you may be working for an organization the main vision is somebody else's but as part of the organization you must envision it for yourself right it's especially if you're a pioneer it's easy you'll get up you'll do it because it's there inside you um, but it's also important to be able to communicate that vision to others right it fires up passion inspires action describes the future it creates focus focus is important right when you're focused on something you will see productivity yes or no right uh, it could be even the smallest of tasks right sometimes you know you, you could be in the kitchen trying to cook something right and then my you know my mind may be wandering everywhere okay what to do these are the new life groups or these are things to do in church and i'll end up doing something that i didn't really plan why there's no focus i'm thinking about something else but i'm doing something else here right oh, but when there's focus you can get things done faster right focus enables us to gives us ideas gives us directions gives us strategies right so we think okay if i do it this way can i do it the other way right now now this way was not productive can i try it the other way right so when you're focused on something it'll really change the way we look at things very important next one vision write it repeat it repeat it and keep repeating it again and again and again habakkuk 2 Verse 2 and 3. Let's read that. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end of it, it, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Yes. You see, the thing about a vision, no? Uh, initially it it will be in us but say for example you're working in an organization one year is over or you finish one year now after one year the vision is sometimes is just thrown out the window something very peculiar about a vision is it can evaporate it can just go out of our mind out of our heart and we may just be doing the work that we are doing not realizing hey am i doing it in line with the vision of the organization or am I just doing it so very important is to repeat the vision write it down put it on tablets as what Habakkuk says I mean you make posters let people see it right so for example you're planning to start a church or a ministry put down your vision don't keep it within yourself and say oh this is what I want to do no Write it down, put it up, let people see it. And then you talk about your personal life as well, right? You you write down the vision that you want, right? Five-year vision, 10-year vision, write it, 
keep writing it if you see my certain some of my books you will find it everywhere i don't know why but it's there everywhere it's there on my wall cupboard it's there it's there on my uh, books it's there my laptop I open my laptop first thing that opens is a word document click on it the vision what i want to be 10 years from now right so i just keep repeating it to myself god this is now over the course of time god can direct our paths but the thing is the vision is something that needs to be reiterated that's why at church every sunday the vision is repeated right so if i wake you all up at 2 o'clock in the night you're in deep sleep i say hey what's the vision of apc you will say it why because it's gone deep into you you know it right so it's very important to reiterate uh keep people uh you know running with that vision and keep people motivated with that vision next very important a compromised vision leaves people confused matthew 6:22 and 23 the lamp of the body is eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in you in darkness how great is that darkness yes now what is the word compromised mean you know when when something is uh how do i say this okay if something is in blue black and white meaning these are things that you have to do and when we don't do it it's we're compromising with the rules or the other word can say you're bending the rules right now a compromised vision leaves people confused if not this way we'll do it this way right? that's compromise but the vision is we will have certain values these are our values no under the table work but there's come a situation okay this one time do it what's happened if compromised on the vision on our values as an organization right now a compromised vision leaves people confused so imagine you are working in an organization or you're leading a ministry or a, or an organization when a vision is blur have you seen in the mirror when the mirror is blur can you see your face clearly same way when a vision is blur people cannot see it right what's happening they are there they, they there is a vision but the vision is blur they don't know what to do there's no clarity right people don't know which part to take and they could you know they stumble they could go off in the wrong direction or they could remain in the same place being stagnant right so if the leaders say if the leadership say do things or, or make decisions that are not aligned to the vision the vision becomes compromised if the leadership do things or say things that are not aligned with the vision then the vision is compromised now when you look at the corporate sector i uh, i know most of us we may be thinking about it in a church aspect right organization as a church but look at it in the corporate sector are there compromises yes right will there be leaders who are compromised definitely yes but how can you and i make a difference in those places stand stand for what god has called you for right you can stand and say hey but this is not what the organization is meant for this is not the value that the organization has has right this is not something that we follow right uh and so you can stand for it right there's nothing wrong because you're standing for the organization and now what happens after that you know you may feel uh, uh people may say mock you ridicule you or uh but if you look at the other hand you're honoring god and i love that verse in psalm 72 it says god places double honor upon his children 
people may dishonor you, make fun of you, ridicule you. God places double honor, right? So look at the bigger picture. When a vision is compromised, the productivity drops, the organization is affected, uh, and, and it just needs to get back to its original state, right? Otherwise, there's not going to be any productivity at all. Fourthly, state your mission loud and clear. Now, we talked about the vision, right? Mission is how are we going to achieve that vision, right? Look at what Jesus tells his disciples, Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Yeah, this is a perfect example of vision, mission put in place. A few chapters before this, now Jesus has chosen his disciples. They have seen, okay, he's the Messiah, right? He's the Messiah and he's the one who's come to save the world. So they saw the vision, right? Meaning, Imagine Peter, Andrew, all the disciples say, oh, the Messiah, the one who Moses and Elijah and Isaiah talks about, the one who is the Holy One of Israel, he's here with us. That's a, they invigorating them. They're just so in awe of this man, Jesus. But it's not, it doesn't end there. What does Jesus say? He gives them the mission. In Luke 4, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for what? To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed. Now, Jesus did not, there was no ambiguity. That means there was no, uh, there was no feeling of, okay, I may do this, I may not do this. There was no compromise there. Jesus said, I've come, and this is what I will do. How, what is the mission? To heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise up those who are dead. That's the mission. And what did he do the next three and a half years? He did it. Right? He didn't tell his disciples, this is my mission, so you go and do it. No, he first did it. He showed them how to do it. And then he appointed them and said, now you go do it. You see how he worked? Beautiful example. There was a vision to reach the world. He applied that vision with a mission, chose the 12, and the 12 went out, right? fulfilling that mission, that mandate. And when people saw him, right? Oh, I, I was sharing this, you know, in the book of John, there were thousands of people following Jesus. Yes, right? 5,000, 8,000, thousands of people following Jesus. Why? Because they knew. Jesus was on a mission and he was doing something. There were healings, there were miracles, there were things that he was doing which nobody else was doing. But after he died, what happened? 120 people. Where are all the thousands? They're not there. Right? But those 120, they held on to the mission. So we got to do this. And I can only picture Peter, right, after how he would have felt, you know, not being there at the death of his master but i can just picture him saying but this is what jesus said we will do so let's take the mission forward and they took it forward and if they had not had a mission or a plan or a strategy nothing would have happened oh jesus is dead and gone well imagine they were just sitting there itself jesus was the messiah he was there we were with him but they're keeping it to themselves the mission is not going to be fulfilled at all. Imagine the Apostle Paul, if he said, Oh, I saw Jesus in the road to Damascus and he's only telling his friends there in Tarsus. Is there any use? No. Because what did he do? First thing, missionary journey. How do I, I have the vision now. How do I fulfill this vision? Mission. Get a plan. Get a strategy. 
work it out. And if you see Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, how beautifully he aligned his missionary journeys. Right. So, so powerful, such a powerful example to learn. So very important, state your mission. Even the Apostle Paul did that. God has called me to be to preach to the Gentiles. That's my mission. That's what God has called me to do. Right now, the other disciples were not too pleased about it. But then he said, it doesn't matter what you think. What God has called me to do, I will do. Right? So state your mission loud and clear and follow that with corresponding action. Right? Next one. Values. Clarify what you really stand for. Right? First Corinthians 14 and verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. For if the trumpets make an uncertain sound, who will prefer for battle? Yeah. So this is an ancient time. So if you look at, um, you know, when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, there were millions of people, right? So it was not easy to coordinate with them. So there were different types of trumpets that were used to call people to action. Right? Now picture this, you've got 12 tribes of Israel, all of them are walking out of Egypt. Now how do you coordinate with all of them? Okay, this tribe you be here, you this tribe you sit here. How do we do that? So there are different methods of coordinating. And one of the ways, one of the trumpets was a trumpet to call of battle. So for example, everyone are relaxing in their tents. It's a cool day. And, and suddenly, the watchmen, you know, during those days, they had the watchmen who would stand and keep a watch on who's, you know, whether the territory is safe. Imagine the watchman blew the trumpet of a battle. Immediately, everyone would get up. Okay, those who are the men will go in front, get ready for battle. Now, imagine there are enemies coming, and this guy, the watchmen, are with a trumpet, but they're not blowing the trumpet loud enough. Or they're not blowing it clearly. What happens? The enemy is going to come and plunder the place. So uh, uh, a trumpet calls people to action. If, you sound, if the sound of the trumpet is uncertain, people will not know what to do. So the same way, in an organization, people need to, you know, we need to have certain values. And these values is what you and I must stand for, right? Uh, now, for example, you are, you are joining a corporate sector, right? You're joining an organization. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, maybe you know, people are, uh, you know, making false reports, right? All of these things. You hold on to the values that you have. You hold on to the values of the organization. I can, you know, we can, we can say with certainty that nobody has an organization with bad values. It could be, I mean, it could be something that is, you know, uh, completely not in line with Christianity. But their values will be something, hey, we want to help the poor people. Right? We have NGOs which are run by people from different faiths, right? And they want to help the children, they want to help the poor, they want to help those who are divorced, and all of these things, right? So values are normally morally right, right? So what, what do we understand here? Core values are not just slogans, right? They are core to the organization. So you hold on to it. Right? So if there are things that are not in line with the organization, tell yourself, hey, I want to, I'm going to do it this way because this is what they are. Now, don't expect applaud. Nobody's going to clap and say, oh, 99 people did it wrong. You did it right. Nobody will clap and say, maybe nobody would have even noticed it. But remember, rewards, God will reward you for the good things you have done. Right? In time, your reward will come. Be patient, right? Just because others are doing something, you don't have to do that, right? Especially in an organization, it calls to stand for certain values that you have. 
and certain values that I have, right? You've got to stand for it. And uh, see, I always say this in in a church setting, it's very easy, very easy. Like in a church, oh, everyone say praise the Lord. But outside of church, if you get to the office, you may not have anyone saying uh, hi, brother, hi, sister, and all. It's a world that is completely different. Right? It's people just want to go up the ladder. They can pounce on you, stand on you, crush you down. So they do. That's that's the corporate life, and it's open. It's not even. It's not something that is hidden. It's open. I'm better than you, and I'm going to get better than you. Competition is really strong. But we'll talk about in a couple of chapters when I'll talk about even competition and uh, how competition is also healthy. But during those times is when we stand for our values. Okay, you tell yourself, this is my value, this is the value of the organization that I'm working for. Now, since I'm working in this organization, I must be a good steward of the organization. So I must obey their values and their culture. You get what I'm saying, right? Uh, don't expect big applause and all of that initially. Remember, God is the one who rewards you, right? So a few core values that we have here. Uh, APC has uh, certain core values. Integrity, right? Integrity. Excellence in what we do. Our value is people, meaning ministry is about people. We treat people with respect. You can come from different cultures, different backgrounds. All of them are treated equally. We pursue creativity. right? So we don't want to keep doing something that uh, without being creative. God is a God who is creative. right? He wants us to be creative as well. Uh, right? Uh, and then unity. Uh, whatever we do. Uh, together is more important than an individual accomplishment, right? So one of the things that we always do at APC is, you know, a person may do well, right? So for example, uh, this is just an example, right? Uh, APC music, right? Now this is just an example, APC music. Oh, uh, a team of people wrote songs, they came up with the music, Right. I think about 40, 50 of them, different teams, wrote songs, came up with a melody, came up with music. But was was the songwriters and musicians brought on stage and uh, everyone clapped for them? You know, some of them who have wrote, written the songs, they don't. They, their names also aren't there. But they've written entire songs. So when we look at it, it is an organization. As an organization, we have released an album. Or we have released it. Within that, there are teams who, who have done it, right? So it's not only about the person, the individual. It is the organization. As a church, this is what we have done. Nobody's put on a pedestal. Yes? Oh, you wrote five songs, you wrote ten songs, you came up. Nobody's put up a pedestal. The point is. Again, goes back to the vision to be salt and light to the city, voice to the nation and the nations. Yes, there are personal rewards that will, you know, we'll appreciate the team and all of that. Uh, but it is first the organization. As a church, this is what we have done. Right? That's just an example. Uh, okay, next one. Create a culture aligned to your vision, mission, and values. Nehemiah 2.20. So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build what you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Yeah. So let's look at this case study of Nehemiah. I'm sure all of us have read about Nehemiah, right? Uh, and let's look at the case study of how God gave him the vision. He implemented that vision. And 
while he impl implemented that vision, he had certain values in place. And that's what made him successful. That's what made him fruitful. It's not easy to build a wall in 52 days. There was no machinery that we have right now that would. But let's look at this case study, okay? How did Nehemiah do this? And we can apply it in our lives as well, right? So just a background, the city of Jerusalem, the Babylonians came, they destroyed uh, Jerusalem, the walls were destroyed, the gates were burned. Nehemiah was serving in the court of the Persian king. Now we all know the story, he was a cupbearer. Now, suddenly he found news, he got news that the walls of Jerusalem, the gates are burnt. Now there were many Jews there, many Jews were there, but something happened to Nehemiah. The Bible says that the moment he heard it, something gripped his heart. He put on sackcloth and ashes and he began to moan. Now tell me, he has a good job, right? Yes or no? He has a good job. What? The king will say, get me something to drink. He has to go get it to drink it. He didn't have any hard labor work. Royalty is relaxing in the, in the king's palace only. But when he heard this, there were, may have been thousands or hundreds of Jews around. Jerusalem, the, the walls are broken. The gates are burned. They would have heard it. Oh, so sad, Jerusalem. What can we do? Can't do anything as of now. But that was not the case for Nehemiah. The moment he heard it, he was burdened. There was anguish in his heart. He put on sackcloth and ashes. There's the vision came. Nehemiah said to himself, I am going to build the walls of Jerusalem. And I'm going to repair the gates. He got the vision. Right? He woke up from his fasting and prayer. And, and I'm sure those days of fasting, he, after he finished that, he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. But Nehemiah, you don't understand where you are. You are in Babylon. You are under the Persian king. You can't do what you want to do. No, that's a vision. right? Look at it. Nehemiah shared the vision with the people of in Jerusalem. right? So now the, the, the whole story goes, he goes to the king. And the king asks him, why is your face so low? What's happened? Oh, Jerusalem is this way. It's, the walls are broken. The gates are burned. So the king says, okay, go do what you have to do. I will supply whatever you need. Now, he's got the permission. The vision has taken one step ahead. What did he do the first thing? Did he keep it to himself? First thing he did, he shared the vision. He went to the people of Jerusalem. Okay, everyone come. I can just picture it, right? Just picture that. Everyone will listen to him because he's got the vision. Right. Everyone come. Okay. See, I spoke to the king. The king said, we can build a wall. And he's given me the papers. He has given me the, uh, the facilities. He's giving me the people as well. So this is the vision. We will go to Jerusalem, build the wall, repair the gates, because that is our city. He shared the vision. Now, the vision was compelling. Imagine the Jews, everyone are saying, Oh, you got the permission. Yeah. Okay, let's do it then. People join that vision. Right? You see what happens when a vision is invigorating? It's like saying, you know, a, a person can come up to you and say, Hey, you know what? Let's start a ministry. Maybe you and your friend come up to you to get you say okay this is the vision i'll start here we will start these bible colleges we will start training centers we'll do this then your heart goes wow yes i'll join you what's happening the, because the vision is invigorating now the same thing a person can share a vision hey you know what we will we'll start a ministry and then we'll do something in 5 years after 5 years we'll retire okay why you want to retire after 5 years the vision doesn't seem invigorating, right? So when a vision is compelling, people are inspired to join. Two, Nehemiah planned out the mission. So he gave the vision. Here's the mission. He planned out how the construction work is to be done. The work was to be divided into 10 gates into the city of the city of Jerusalem. 
each group of people were assigned some work at their side of the gate. Makes sense? Makes sense. So just picture this. You've got the wall. You've, so what he said was, there are houses here everywhere. right? So those who are closest to the wall go do the work, come back. Now remember this. They were in captivity. So they were, had to also work. Right? So just picture this, right? Monday to Saturday, Friday, they're working for the Persian Empire, right? They, whatever work they're doing, they could be in the farm or whatever, right? Whatever occupation they're doing. Monday to Friday. And this is an example. Okay. okay, Saturday, Sunday is there. So Saturday and Sunday, they would go near the wall and do as much as they could. Then Monday into Monday to Friday, after work, they would come back. Oh, I can do some more work. So they would go to the closest section, do as much as they could do. Now picture this. Nehemiah is not there saying, hey, you have, you're free. No, why don't you go to the wall? No. What happened? The vision is compelling. Oh, we have to finish the wall. See what happens? So Nehemiah gave the mission. Near a section of the wall, you finish. You don't have to travel from east to west to build a wall. You see your section and make sure that that is done right. right. Then, here's the interesting part. He added values. First, everyone believed that God, the God of heaven, will prosper them. So everyone are doing the work, but they believe that, hey, God will prosper them. Two, they believe that, you know, we all will arise and build. Now, some of them were probably farmers. Some of them were probably carpenters, woodworkers, or just doing other small works. Not everyone were in the construction business there. But they said, all of us will get up and do it. We don't know it, we will learn it. But we have to do it, right? And three, they knew there were oppositions and hindrances that would come. Yet everyone were determined that nothing will stop them. Look at those three powerful values. One, God was on their side. Two, we will all work. You know, when you look at it, even Nehemiah put his hand to the plow. He also went and did the work. Nehemiah was not sitting there under the tree with an umbrella, somebody standing, you know, holding an umbrella and saying, okay, what about this side of the wall? No, he put his hand, he did it. Right? All of them worked. And three, they had this, they knew that obstacles are going to come, hindrances are going to come, but nothing will stop us. But if you read the story, there were certain places where they were very upset with Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you didn't tell us all this. But he reiterated the vision. Remember, God is with us. Remember, if God has brought us so far, he will help us to finish the wall. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of those who are coming against us. Because the God of heaven is on our side. They continued to work. Right? So these were certain values that they had. And then let's go down. Culture. Again, under Nehemiah's leadership, everyone worked. They all worked. See, there were priests. Look at that. Everyone worked. Everyone, the priests, goldsmiths, perfumers, district leaders, Levites, gatekeepers, merchants, and common people. Imagine the priests. Those who are uh, in the uh, temple the whole time, what do they know about you know constructing a wall? Nothing. What about gatekeepers? What about the Levites? Because Levites were higher, you know, standing. No, because they were called, separated by God. Levites. They also did it. So it's not like oh, Levites, you go pray and we'll do the thing. No, you pray later, you come and build a wall also, right? And it's good. And everyone did it. Uh, district leaders, the, le the gatekeepers, merchants, and common people. They all worked hard with their heart and their mind. Everyone worked with their heart. It was not like, oh, what is this Nehemiah? Suddenly he came out of nowhere and he's saying, build the wall, build the wall. Why do we need this wall? Why do we need a gate? Anyway, we are here in Babylon. We can go, go back to Babylon, rest. Why do we need all of this? No, they all worked with their heart and their 
mind. Everything that they had, they put into it. Four, oh, they supported each other. Uh, so they were when they were under threat. This is interesting, very interesting. Look at this, Nehemiah 4.16. So it was from that time on, half of my servants worked at the construction, while the other half held spears and shields and bows and wore armor, and, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. So what happened was Nehemiah knew that you know, Sanballat and uh, there are people that are going to come and attack the wall. So what did he do? Again, use wisdom. He said, okay, here's what you do. We can't stop building the wall just because there's going to be opposition. 50% of you start keep working on the wall. The other half, you stand with spears and uh, armory. In case they come, you have to go for battle. And so it made sense. And so I can only picture it. They took shifts. Two days you stand, two days I'll stand. Just an example. But he did it. Right? And the rulers were urged to be generous. Wow, this is also oh, beautiful. Now, remember, during those times, there were rich leaders, right? There were rich people also. The, the Jews were rich. They had land. They would sell land and all of that. So those who were in debt, right? So for example, um, you know, for example, I'm in debt, right? I have purchased somebody, the, another person's land. I'm in debt. How can we both work together? Whenever I look at him, I say, Salomon, I have to pay him no, for the money that I took from him. But Nehemiah said, for now, don't look at all that. Master, slave, don't look at all that. Clear of, forget about the debt. Be generous. So probably Nehemiah went and said, see, listen, what is priority now? The wall of Jerusalem is priority. So you forget about all this. I know that this is the thing right now. Be generous. Forgive his debt. Finish the debt so that you all both can look eye to eye and work together. Perfect example of a powerful leader. A good leader does that. He's able to resolve conflicts. He's able to bring things, you know, make sure that people are working in unison with one another. Right? Look at this. In verse Nehemiah 5, 10 to 12, Nehemiah said, I've let the people borrow money and grain from me, and so have many companions and those who work for me. Now let's give up all our claims to repayment and cancel all the debts they owe me, owe you money or grain or wine or olive oil, and give them back to their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses right now. The leaders replied, We'll do as you say, we'll give back the we'll we'll give the property back and not try to collect debts. See that? We'll do as you say. None of them had were like, saying, no, but then what about my family? What about my children? None of them. They said, okay. Since you're saying, Nehemiah, you're a man with a vision, we'll follow it. Right? Finally, Nehemiah led by example. Through his life example, he led. He was... Even though he was the governor of the land, right? He here's what look at this in verse Nehemiah 5, 14 through 16. We'll read that, okay? During all the 12 years that I was governor of the land of Judah, from the 20th year of Artaxerxes was empire, was emperor until his 32nd year, neither my relatives nor I ate food I was entitled to have as a governor. Every governor who had been in office before me had a burden, had been a burden to the people and had demanded 40 silver of coin, 40 silver coins a day for food and wine. Even the servants had oppressed the people, but I act differently because I honored God. I put all my energy into building the wall and did not acquire any property. Everyone who worked for me joined in the rebuilding. Look at that. Nehemiah led by example. He didn't oppress the people. He didn't say, you give me taxes. I'm the governor. He says, just like you all are sacrificing, even I sacrifice. I didn't eat from the table. I didn't relax in those AC rooms in the palace. But I did what I had to do. I sacrificed. Right? Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue from here. Thank you.